Welcome to part three in this lecture on HTML. And now we go into a bit more advanced constructs in HTML. So things that usually are more than a single tag, but a combination of things. Um, and the most basic one is of course a table. You might want to display information that is in, in tabular form. Um, and you can do so using the table tag. Um, just as a word of warning, in the past, tables were used quite heavily for layouting because you can, of course, make sure that if you have two columns, then the first column is to the left of the other one and so on. Uh, so they are kind of suited for that, but nowadays you would usually not do that. You would use uh, different things, which we get later too. Um, so the idea is really just to display tabular information. Um, Tab tables can have three tags that are optional. They can have a tag indicating the body, so kind of the content of the table, the heading, uh, sort of the title, what are the, the title row, what kind of different column names do you have, and the footer. Um, you don't need those things, but they sort of add semantic information. They tell the browser that, okay, everything that's in the body is body information, in the head is uh, heading. Uh, and that can, for example, be used for, for styling later on. You might want to give the heading a different look. For example, all the, all the columns are bold-faced and the body is just regular. Uh, so that's usually the purpose of that. Uh, but then the most classical things uh, that help you to structure the table are the TR, TH and TD heading uh, tags. Sorry. TR defines a row in a table, so simply a uh, horizontal uh, space. TH is a cell in the header. So if you have the header tag, you can use the TH to define the, the cells, the columns. Uh, if you are anywhere else, you use the TD instead. So that's just a cell. Uh, and then you can have a caption to give it uh, a nice caption that describes the table. Now, the best way to demonstrate this is to have a look. Um, and we do that by going to the fourth file here. This is just a table example. Uh, and here I'm using the, the entire, uh, I don't have a footer, okay, but everything else I have. So you see that I start with a table tag, it ends down here. Uh, and ideally I should change the indentation here. Uh, then I have a caption that says my table. So it's sort of the description of my table. Uh, I have a header. That says, okay, here is here is sort of the title row, uh, and in that I first define a, a row, uh, and then two cells. So first name, last name, um, and then in, I have my body. Again, I have one row, and I just have two cells saying, stating my name. So this just gives you a table that somewhere has a description. Uh, it has a title with two columns, and it has a content part. So if we look at that you'll get this very boring table. Uh, here is the caption. This is the first title column, the second title column, and then content. Uh, if you want to add to that, you could just add, for example, a new row. So I could just say TR uh, and then say whatever, John Doe. And you'll see that I'll get another column. So this is a very straightforward way to display tabular information. And you'll note now that there is no, no borders here. There's no styling. So it's, it doesn't look very nice. But again, the styling will come later. So it's really uh, CSS that is used for styling. Um, so the only important thing we need here is, is the information displayed in the right way? And that's what we have. It could, however, manage uh, happen that if you use a different browser or a different version of Firefox that, for example, the borders are there by default. So that really just depends on the browser. And this is exactly the example I have in the HTML file. Now, tables are nice. Um, they're useful quite often, but one thing that is much more useful, even though at, at this point in time you maybe uh, don't see the purpose, are so-called divisions or divs. Uh, divisions are containers. There is 
it's just a invisible container by default and they are so-called block elements. We'll talk about that later, but it basically means that if you start a diff tag, uh, it causes a line break and it uses as much horizontal space as possible. So it basically just blocks the entire uh, horizontal space. And within a diff, you can just have regular tags as before. So if you look at this example, I'm just defining a division. Uh, and within that, I just have a header and a paragraph. That's it. Um, this is fairly boring. So you'll see that uh, these divisions here, they are basically just blank text. So you will not see much difference to just having paragraphs. Um, if we just look at that, you'll see that here. This is exactly the same as just using paragraphs, nothing special. Uh, what I do then, here I'm, I'm already going to lecture five. You don't have to understand what this means, but I basically define colors just so that you see that they are actually different boxes. So you, I'm using different colors for the different divs, different background colors, uh, but otherwise it's exactly the same as above. And you'll see the difference. So you see exactly that this is actually one box, this is one box, this is one box, and this is one box. Uh, and as we have discussed, you also see that the box goes the entire horizontal space. If I re uh, if I resize my window, you'll also see that there are no scroll bars coming. So it's not it's not like this box is this large, but it just adapts with my window. So that's uh, a diff. These diffs are really useful because again of styling later on, we can basically define the, the own style for each diff. Uh, and that's then one of the main things that is used for layouting. So diffs nowadays uh, have replaced tables for, for the purpose of layouting almost everywhere. So whenever you want to have a specific part of your page that looks a certain way, you would use a diff in many cases. Um, and that's because CSS, next lecture, can be used for coloring, resizing, positioning, and so on. Uh, you'll use this heavily later on, so the first assignment uh, will definitely be lots of diffs uh, that you somehow have to style using CSS. So these are very simple but extremely powerful because they can be adapted so easily. So as I said here, diffs are block elements and it's maybe important to do a small excursion to what that means. Uh, most elements in HTML are either these kind of block elements or so-called inline elements. Uh, and they have two distinct behaviors. A block element, similar like as the diff, starts in a new line and it takes as much width, as much horizontal space as possible. Uh, so you see here, these are two diffs and you see that they take all the space and they start in a new line. Inline elements are different. They start from where you are right now and they only take as much space as needed. Uh, and one of the examples is span, which is a text. Uh, it's just a text span, but it's an inline element. And you see here, these are two spans. And the second one just starts directly after the other one. There's just one space in between, and then you have the next one. And I also did some coloring here, so you see that these take only as much space as they need, not more. Um, so that's a very important thing. And I have it in file seven. Uh, so that's exactly what I displayed. You see that there are two diffs uh, with two different colors. And there are two spans uh, with two different colors. And it's just a line break in between. And what you see is exactly what's on the slide. So you see that there is here all the space is used. Uh, and there's a line break here, only as much space as needed and no line break. And again, uh, this is important to know because later on when you will adapt how things look or how they behave, uh, it's important to know for, for the layouting how the elements behave. Because if it's a block element, it will always take all of the space. So if you change it, uh, it might behave slightly different. So that's an important concept to understand. Now, as a last part in this uh, series, we do forms. And forms are what you see whenever you log in somewhere, whenever you use a contact form. These are things that are used to collect inputs. So it's the classical thing 
that you, for example, spot when you go to Google, this is a contact form. So something, uh, not a contact, a form in general. It's something where you can put in text uh, and have buttons and so on. So contact forms are used to collect input of any type. And typically that's input fields like text, password, buttons, checkboxes, text boxes, and so on. Um, they are a bit tricky to understand, uh, but in general, it's the form tag. So you start form and you end it somewhere, and in between you put everything you want to have there. Uh, so we just ignore this up here for now, but you see that here I have a form. In there I have an input field of type text. So that's just text input, uh, and I give it a name. That's not so relevant for now, but that's important when you want to use it for something uh, later on. And the same you can do, for example, with password. There is an input type password that just, instead of text, it does not show the text, but it gives you these dots. Um, and then you have a type that is submit. That's a button, basically. It's a submit button um, and it has a text. So the value is login. That's what the button displays. Uh, and when you click on it, something happens. And this, whatever something happens is, uh, is really what we get into when we do JavaScript, when we do behavior. For now, we just display things and this form won't be very useful, um, but that's what it'll do. Now, let's look at the details here. Action, and then we have a URL. Uh, this basically means that if the form is submitted, if someone clicks the submit button, we will call this URL, we will refer, we will request this URL and we will use a certain method. And this, if you remember, are the different HTTP methods. So here we can do in HTML, we can use get and post, um, get to receive something, post in general to post, to create or to change something. Uh, Maybe not that important right now, but these are the two things you need to specify. So basically you need to specify the HTTP request. You need to say which method and which URL. Then you have the submit button. As I said, that's the one that when you click it, it triggers this HTTP request uh, and it can have an additional behavior, JavaScript usually. Now, uh, the name here that I've discussed, that's the variable name. So when you later on in JavaScript or in any other language, you want to process the data that the, the user has sent, uh, you have to use these variable names. So you know that you will get uh, this URL will get a get request with a request body that has a user and a password variable. So that's important to know. <clears throat> so to summarize what this form does is that whenever you press the submit button, you do an HTTP request that goes to this URL uh, using the get method in this case, and it includes the form data. So whatever the user has entered here with the specified variable names. So that's what happens. Uh, and we can look at this. I have exactly the same uh, stuff here. I have only added a proper URL, but that's uh, maybe not that important. So right now I just reference the same uh, the same page. So whenever someone clicks submit, they just end up on the same website. If I open this, you see that here is my form. I have username and then I can add something. I have password and if I do something here, you see the dots. Uh, and whenever I click submit, you will see that this just reloads. If you pay attention, you'll see that there was a quick uh, reload where basically this just uh, reloaded the whole thing. Okay, so that's uh, a basic form. Now you can add a lot of different elements uh, and I'll just show some of them here. And this is really something to play around with. A good reference for this is, for example, the, the first two literature references I've given in this lecture. Uh, so there you get an overview of all the different things you can do. You have already seen the input field. So that's to add text. You have seen the submit button uh, to submit. And then there are other things you typically see. For example, a radio button. That's simply input type radio. Uh, 
again, you have a variable name and you have a value, which is uh, whatever is submitted in the body. So if someone now selects user and submits in the request body in HTTP, you will get uh, role equals user. You can also have checkboxes, which are just like these multi checkboxes. It's the same thing, input type checkbox. Uh, and again, variable name value, same thing. Uh, then we get to drop down menus. These are the select tag. Uh, and here I give a name, a variable name to the entire menu. Uh, so that's the variable name that will be included in the HTTP request. And then you can have different options. So here I basically add two options. You can select a car, either a Volvo or a Saab. Uh, and depending on which one you select, the request will have a different value for the variable. So if you select Volvo, it will be cars equals Volvo, otherwise Saab, uh, as simple as that. Finally, uh, you can disable elements if you just put in disabled. And at this point in time, that's not very useful. So you cannot modify them then. But later on, when we use JavaScript, you can, of course, uh, enable or disable things. So for example, you could enable the submit button only if the username is put in or things like that. Or if there is no valid email address, you disable the submit button or things like that. Uh, so that's a typical thing. If we look at uh, file six forms here, you see a selection of all of these things. There are also a number of other things um, that might be interesting to you. So let's have a look. So here you simply see a form that has different kinds of things. It has a uh, username, password as before. You see that I disabled this one, uh, cannot change it. Here I have my drop down menu. Uh, I have a radio button group, so I can only select one of the two. Uh, text box that you can actually resize and these kind of check boxes here. And then you can submit this. Uh, Apparently, I have specified some URL that does not exist. Yeah, so 8forms.html does not exist. And that's why I get, when I submit, I get an error. So maybe I should change this to six forms. Uh, and now when I submit, uh, when I submit, it will just reload this page. So that's how forms work. Number of other things that are essentially in the, uh, in the HTML file as well. So you have seen the text area, that's the text area tag. Uh, you can define how many rows and columns it has, but this can be modified as you have seen. You get this little button to resize. Uh, you can also provide labels for an element. So you can say, give me a label for the field with, with ID user. And then you have the input that has this ID. Uh, so then you, you make sure that the label and the input are actually paired. They belong together. Um, and finally, you can group things together using these field sets, uh, which basically just make sure that uh, parts in your form are grouped. So if you look here, um, wherever my form is, you'll see that I have these two boxes and uh, one box only with user information. So this simply means that there is a field set and these things somehow belong together. Uh, if we look into the code, you'll see that I have defined the field set here and I have defined a legend, basically an explanation for this group. Okay, as a last part, uh, you have seen this method here, get, and HTML allows you to use get or post uh, to send the HTTP request. And essentially there are two different, they differ in how the variables here are included, uh, are sent. And when you use get, what happens is that the variables here are actually appended to the URL. So I've simplified this so far, but uh, the truth is that they are actually not in the uh, in the request in the request body, as I've said. Uh, but whatever I submit here, so let's say I put ASD ASD and ASD in the username, 
if I submit, you will see that here something has happened. Uh, and that's what happens when you do a GET request in a form. The variables are added to the URL. And uh, if you remember lecture two, this question mark is the query part of the URL. So this was additional information. We basically have added the uh, variables as part of the URL. So now you see username equals ASD, password equals ASD, ASD. And you also see here, of course, that the password is clear text, so it has not anyhow disappeared. Um, if I instead do post, so I have the same file here, I have just changed the method to post. Uh, then you will note that if I do the same thing again and I press submit, you do not see the stuff up here. So instead of adding it to the URL, the request is sent in the body. Uh, and I'm not sure we can see this here. We probably cannot, but let's... No, we cannot see that here, but uh, you'll have to believe me that the variables are still there. They are just, instead of the URL, we have put them into the body of the request. Um, so this is what I said before. This is what happens when you do a get. Uh, when you do a post, the, the URL does not change. It does not get any additional variables. Okay. So that's for this part. And then in the fourth and last part of this lecture, we cover uh, things like semantic elements, accessibility and other concerns.